Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Nicole Meldahl, Executive Director of Western Neighborhoods Project, a teeny tiny community history nonprofit focused on preserving and sharing the diverse history and culture of San Francisco's West Side. And you can find out more about that on our website, outsidelands.org. But before I landed this job, I worked for the California Historical Society in guest services. So that's a long way of saying that I'm very proud to be guest hosting my second program, Set the Night on Fire, LA in the 60s with author John Wiener for CHS Tonight. And to start this evening, I'd like to first acknowledge that the California Historical Society is headquartered in San Francisco in the unceded territory of the Ramatosholone. It is our job at CHS to not only remember this fact, but also to make California's rich and complicated and diverse past a meaningful part of contemporary life. And CHS accomplishes this through public programs like this, through its research library and collections, and by hosting exhibitions. Our current exhibition, Rare Historical Curious Selections from the Collection, is now on view for free 24-7 in the windows of CHS's headquarters at 678 Mission Street. So please visit and consider making a donation to support this work using a link we'll be adding in the chat now. And speaking of the chat, I see Amelia Marshall got us started pretty fast. Thank you, Amelia, for that wonderful kickoff comment. I do have a few housekeeping manners to address before we move on to our program, though. We have great news for you. This program is being recorded, and the video will be available on the CHS YouTube channel in the next few days. More great news. We will be answering questions at the end of the program tonight. So for those in the Zoom room with us live, please send us questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Otherwise, please feel free to add comments and chat with each other in the appropriately named chat box, also located in the bottom of your screen. And for those watching the recording on YouTube later who think this is a great program, please like it, share it, and leave comments below. Now, no matter how you're connecting with us, we do ask that you please be respectful and help keep all channels of communication open and safe. Now, that means we expect everyone to engage here with empathy and um, with honesty focused on history. Also, I do wanna let you know that some images in this presentation pertain to violent episodes in California's past that might be triggering today. So please be advised and do take care. I have to say, it's truly wonderful to be here with so many of you tonight, and I know CHS wants to keep bringing you programs like this, but they do need your help to do that. In this spirit, I'll launch a brief poll in a few minutes and ask you to answer a few questions. Why are we asking you to do this? Well, because your anonymous feedback translates into data that helps CHS access important grant funding for programs like these. This is 100% voluntary and poll results will not be shared with the audience. So please, with that in mind, take the next two minutes or so to answer a few short multiple choice questions for us. And don't forget to hit the submit button at the end of the poll. So ready, set, poll. With that business behind us, I'd now like to introduce you to our speaker. John Wiener is an American historian and journalist based in Los Angeles, California. His decades long legal battle for the release of the FBI's files on John Lennon, a critic of the Vietnam War, resulted in Gimme Some Truth, the John Lennon FBI files. His other books include How We Forgot the Cold War, A Historical Journey Across America, and Conspiracy in the Streets, The Extraordinary Trial of the Chicago Eight. Wiener is a professor emeritus of United States history at the University of California, Irvine, and a contributing edit editor to the weekly magazine, The Nation, where he hosts the weekly podcast, Start Making Sense. He also hosts Living in the USA, a weekly program, radio program in Los Angeles. 
And I was so sorry to hear Wiener's co-author, Mike Davis, passed away in October 2022. Davis wrote numerous books, including the award-winning City of Quartz, Excavating the Future in Los Angeles, which stands as one of the most significant works about Los Angeles to date. And I must say, I was profoundly taken with Set the Night on Fire when I read it, so much so that I immediately messaged Karen Garcia and said, CHS has to share this book somehow. Because seeing students change their cities is incredibly empowering, as is unmasking the inequitable backbone of California policing and politics. Time and time again, we see the, that truth is power in this book, which can be heavy, but is also really uplifting. And the myth of California can be hard to overcome as a historian, and LA is so vast and complex that it sometimes feels impossible to properly explain and to capture. But Davis and John Wiener were able to cover a lot of ground in Set the Night on Fire because they themselves walked that ground as movement activists. And I truly believe history is most powerful when shared by people who were present for it. So with that in mind, I think you're in for an incredible evening. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome John Wiener to share his perspective. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, John. Well, Nicole, thank you. That was a very nice introduction. And thanks also to Aaron Garcia and Francis Kaplan and the California Historical Society for inviting me. I'm sure many of our listeners are engaged with politics these days or, or movement activists themselves. And I'm sure some were part of the movements of the 60s and 70s. Berkeley and Oakland and San Francisco State set the standard for everybody in the country in those decades. And I'm looking forward to the discussion after the talk to find out more about your experiences and uh, ideas let me now launch this. <clears throat> well, first of all, just a little picture of where I'm going to go in the next 40 minutes. I want to say a few words about Mike Davis, then uh, talk about kind of the where, what people have thought about LA in the 60s and the, our differences with that in terms of the power, sources of power and the sources of protest. Uh, especially the hinge of the Watts Rebellion in 1965. And then I'm going to focus on three uh, key moments. Uh, 1967, the anti-war movements protest in Century City. 1968, the presidential election and the creation of the California Peace and Freedom Party. And then the lesser known story in 1969 of the first campaign of Tom Bradley for mayor, which eventually four years later, elected the first black mayor of Los Angeles. Then I'll say a few words at the end about uh, then and, and now. Uh, Mike Davis, uh, City of Quartz was, of course, his masterpiece, published in 1990. The LA Times just ranked it as number one on the list of absolute best books on LA of all time. Uh, cover of the first edition here shows the LAPD Metropolitan Detention Center. Marshall Berman reviewed it in The Nation. He said, in this book, we find both the radical citizen who wants to grasp the totality of his city's life and the urban gorilla aching to see the whole damn thing blow. Uh, here's Mike uh, around the maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Um, because of the, of the surprise success of City of Quartz, published by Verso, a small left-wing press, Mike got a big contract and a big publisher for his follow-up book on LA, Ecology of Fear, uh, dealt with earthquakes, forest fires, floods, wild animals, uh, became a bestseller. One chapter became a classic. It was called The Case for Letting Malibu Burn. And it argued that fire budgets would be better spent protecting crowded inner city neighborhoods than on the mega mansions in built in remote uh, hill, hillside fire areas. And that chapter provoked its own firestorm. Uh, his critics were led by a Mal to Malibu realtor. They really couldn't refute his argument, so they went after his footnotes. Uh, they checked all his footnotes, something that doesn't happen to very many historians and found surprise 
some of them didn't line up right or some some of them weren't complete um this became a big story in both the la times and the new york times which ran stories about this controversy but the controversy faded and the arguments became stronger la times columnist gustavo ariano wrote in 2018 during the fire season when fires circle la and the sky is full of smoke for weeks I always think about the case for letting Malibu burn. I want to put in a plug for what I think is Mike's most original and really most significant book that isn't as well known, Late Victorian Holocausts, El Nino Famines and the Making of the Third World, published in 2001. He said it was a fa the favorite. He enjoyed writing this book more than any other book. Um, brings together global, global climate history and the global history of colonialism. Um, a historian, a, a world historian at the University of Chicago named Ken Pomerantz explained it best. Mike Davis combines political economy, meteorology and ecology with vivid narratives to create a book that is both a gripping read and a major conceptual achievement. Lots of us talk about writing world history and interdisciplinary history. Here is the genuine article. Mike had been thinking in the meantime about writing a movement history of LA. When I interviewed him for the Radical History Review, which is not this magazine, in 2003, this is 20 years ago, he said, my day job currently is a grassroots history of Los Angeles in the 60s, which he said would be called setting the night on fire. I kept bugging about how is this project on LA in the 60s going? We got the first glimpse of this new project in 2007 when a chapter appeared, an excerpt appeared in this magazine. It's a, perhaps there are not too many subscribers out there, it is a Canadian bilingual journal of labor history, Labor Le Travail. And it included a, an article by Mike called Riot Nights on Sunset Strip, eventually anthologized in his book, I think it was Barbarians at the Gates. Um, Riot Nights on Sunset Strip had a memorable first sentence, a moment in rock and roll dream time, Saturday night on Sunset Strip in December 1967. Riot Nights on Sunset Strip recounted the history of how thousands of young people in, in, in LA fought the police, ostensibly over a curfew. Mike called the battle the most celebrated episode in the struggle of teenagers of all colors during the 1960s to create their own realm of freedom and carnivalesque sociality within the Southern California night. But you could read it that spring only in the 2007 issue of the bilingual Canadian scholarly journal Labour Le Travail. At the end of the headnote, as you can see on this page, he explained that this was, quote, the first small installment of a projected history of LA's countercultures and protesters setting the night on fire. This was all we knew of Mike's new project. Six years later, January 1st, 2014, he sent me an email asking if I would help him co-author the book. Of course, I said yes. We wrote chapters and exchanged them for two years. Then in November 2016, Mike was diagnosed with esophageal cancer, which had already killed his mother and his older sister. He got surgery and uh, chemo for that, uh, which kept him in pretty good shape for a couple of years, enough time for him to finish his part of the book and see the book published and do some publicity for it in, in 2020. Uh, here's Mike, uh, one of the last photographs of Mike a couple of months before he died in 2022. LA in the 60s, the way we have been thinking, way, way for decades we thought about LA in the 60s was a legendary youth paradise of sun, sand, and surfing, and surf music, a place where on TV, good-looking young white guys comb their hair. Now, you'll notice that all of these images 
of Southern California in the 60s, you'll notice that people of color are missing. It was a youth paradise, but only for white people. And this is really the start of setting the night on fire. The most important thing about LA for young people of color living in the city was the LAPD, headed by Police Chief Bill Parker, supported by Mayor Sam Yorty. They enforced a ruthless regime of police repression and rigid social segregation. Here we see the Chief of Police, Bill Parker, uh, he gripping his gun in a rather unusual way. Bill Parker also made sure that the image of the LAPD was spread throughout the country by one of the most popular TV shows of the 50s and 60s, Dragnet. He supervised the scripts to make sure that the LAPD was always portrayed in a heroic uh, light. Our book has as its center Black and Chicano protests, the struggle of lives of people of color, especially young people. Um, civil rights activism in LA in the 60s began with the way it did many other places, a nonviolent direct action movement here in LA, it focused on housing segregation. Didn't have very much success. The turning point in the history of movement LA and all of LA came in 1965, with the Watts Uprising, August 1965. After that, uh, civil rights became a movement for black power. And in the book, we first tell the stories of the movements that led to Watts and the movements that came out of the Watts Rebellion. And then the other movements that kind of swirled around it, the anti-war movement, the women's movement, the gay liberation movement, the counterculture. But I'm not going to talk about those movements uh, right now. I'm gonna, in view of the coming 2024 election, I thought I would talk about politics in LA. Uh, uh, I, three, those three moments of politics in LA. Let me just say one thing about this picture. When you look for pictures of, of the Watts Rebellion, I would say 99% of them, the photographer is standing behind the police lines, protected by the police. This was the only one I could find where there's no cops protecting the photographers. And actually it was not taken by an American, it was taken by a French photographer. And what he captured here is what Mike called the carnivalesque aspect of, of, this, of the first day of the Watts uprising. Uh, this is like a street festival uh, where young people of color, especially young black men in this picture, uh, control their own streets, uh, which never happened uh, before in their lives. So where I wanna start today, I wanna focus on three key political episodes, the 1967 Century City anti-war protest, the 1968 election and the striking remarkable creation of the Peace and Freedom Party. And in 1969, that first campaign of Tom Bradley for mayor, all are connected. Century City in 1967. 1967, Lyndon Johnson was preparing to run for re-election. The war in Vietnam was reaching a peak. Almost half a million soldiers had been sent to Vietnam and hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese had been killed by Americans. The question for opponents of the war in, in LA and everywhere else was what to do about the incumbent president. It seemed like could not, you could not bear for LBJ to be president for another day. But at the same time, he was a Democrat who had done many great things at the beginning of his term, Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, Medicare. But now he had to be removed from office somehow or other. Lyndon Johnson himself was preparing to run for re-election in the spring and summer of 1967, and he decided to launch his re-election campaign in Los Angeles with a gala fundraiser at the most exciting new spot in town, the Century City Hotel. Century City in West LA was just being developed in 1967. A few buildings had been built. Mostly it was just construction sites, empty lots in the Century Plaza Hotel. Um, this was going to be a $1,000 a plate dinner at this fancy new hotel. 
LA was a crucial base for Johnson's reelection camp campaign, had the second largest Democratic vote of any place in the United States, New York being first. It's also the home, home of celebrities who raised a lot of money and gave a lot of money to the Democrats. And uh, so Johnson thought this is the appropriate place to begin his reelection campaign. Century City, Ga Century City Gala was going to feature a legendary comedian, Jack Benny, as the MC, music by the Supremes. Anti-war activists decided we're going to greet Lyndon Johnson in Century City with a big anti-war demonstration. Here's the poster, bring them home alive. Stop the war now at the Century Plaza Hotel, June 23rd. Police expected about a thousand people to show up. In fact, 10 or 15,000 showed up. The protest started with a rally uh, in the park next to the Rancho Park Golf Course called Century Hills Park, any, any Cheviot Hills Park. Uh, if any of you are from LA or have been to LA, this is the place at the corner of Pico Boulevard and Motor. Golf courses on the south side, Fox Studios on the north side, where the picket lines have just come down in the last couple of days. So there was a rally in the park. Thousands of people gathered in the park to prepare for the march. And of course, there were speakers, including a surprise speaker, Muhammad Ali. At that moment, he was a hero of the anti-war movement. Two months earlier, he had refused induction into the military, saying those famous words, I don't got no quarrel with them Viet Cong. Three days before the Century City March, he had been convicted of draft evasion, and the penalty was horrifying. Five years in prison for the greatest boxer in the world, and after that, banned from the sport for the rest of his life. At the park here, he spoke only briefly. He said, we are not for violence. If anyone starts something, it won't be this group. The police will have to start it. Close quote. That turned out to be prophetic. Here's a view of the march from the top of the Century City Hotel, looking south down Avenue of the Stars. You can see that right now, this is all the uh, high rise uh, office buildings and uh, on the other side, uh, uh, condos. Um, there's, you can see that 10 or 15,000 people marches blocks long. They're fill completely three lanes of uh, the northbound side of Avenue of the Stars, the southbound lanes have been shut for police access only. All of this had been carefully negotiated with police. The march route, the march schedule, what was going to happen, where. Uh, and the plan was the marchers will march past the hotel, they will get to chant, stop the war, and after marching past the hotel, they will disperse and go home. Here, as night fell, you can see what who the marchers were. Uh, this is not what protest marches look like anymore. Men in suits, women in dresses. We see a little kid here. People brought their children. It's a little kid in the lower uh, left-hand corner here. And what's impressive, this is not a march of young people. There's a lot of young people, but there's a lot of people who aren't so young. And there's also children as well. So. They were not prepared to fight the police, you will notice. Um, there was one part of the march that was young militant activists, and they had planned with the police to conduct a peaceful sit-in in front of the hotel. A couple of dozen people who were in SDS and progressive labor. Uh, the plan was they would sit in, they would get arrested. And of course, Sitting in was a long established tactic of civil disobedience, a time honored form of protest, explained most eloquently by Martin Luther King in his letter from a Birmingham jail. Sitting in and getting arrested was a way to demonstrate the depth of your commitment, the seriousness of your uh, commitment. The understanding was the police was they would arrest the small group of people sitting in, the rest of the marchers would continue marching past the hotel and the march eventually would disperse. That's not what happened. What happened was the march came to a halt in front of the hotel. 
This happened for several reasons. Partly the police had squeezed it down from three lanes to two lanes, so there was a big, big gridlock. Uh, second, there's about 500 people or so who had not participated in the march, but just showed up at the hotel to cheer the marchers, boo the president, and see what was going to happen. And they weren't in on the planning, and they weren't planning to pass the hotel and disperse. Uh, so it was very crowded outside the hotel when the march stopped moving. Now, what the police should have done at that point was arrest the people who were sitting in, that's what they were expecting to happen, and help the march get moving again so people could disperse. But instead, the police declared the march an illegal assembly and ordered all 10,000 people to disperse. But of course, the majority of people, as you saw, were lined up for black blocks down Avenue of the Stars, never heard the order to disperse in front of the hotel. But the police, now a 1,000 LA cops in riot gear, charged the 10,000 people and began clubbing them for failure to disperse. This went on for a very long time. One hour, police clubbed the 1,000 people, who many of whom had no idea what was going on. They chased people down Olympic Boulevard. They chased them down Santa Monica Boulevard into Beverly Hills. This was that nice crowd of middle-class, middle-aged families with men in suits and women in dresses. They had never experienced anything like it. They'd never been clubbed or chased by cops. So it was big news. And the next day was huge news. War, protest, Mars, LBJ visit. What did this mean for the anti-war movement? And what did this mean for LBJ launching his campaign in the hotel with music by the Supremes. Well, for LBJ, it was the worst possible beginning for his re-election campaign. The day after this headline, the LA Times ran a second front page story that said anti-war protests nearly drove the president out of Los Angeles. They reported that the police and the Secret Service were so concerned about the march, quoting from the LA Times, quote, the president ate his dinner at the Century Plaza Hotel, expecting to be rushed from the hotel at any minute to a waiting helicopter. This was the city with the largest Democratic vote anywhere in the country west of Manhattan. LBJ had to wonder, if he couldn't have a campaign event in LA, where could he campaign? Uh, what kind of campaign could he possibly have if he couldn't appear in public? And indeed, after Century City, LBJ never campaigned in public again. And we know that within a few weeks, he started talking to his most trusted private friends and advisors about pulling out of his reelection campaign. Now, we didn't announce that until the following March, just after the New Hampshire primary. March 1968 is when those of us who were around then found out all about it. But he had actually decided to do this many months before. And I think it's pretty clear that Century City began the process that led LBJ to pull out of his own reelection campaign, an unprecedented event in the history of American politics, and in many ways, the biggest achievement of the movement in LA for the decade. Well, that's what Century City meant for LBJ. What did it mean for politics in LA? Well, it had a transformative effect on politics in the city, but it took a few years for that to unfold. Um, the, White liberals of the West Side had never experienced the brutality of the LAPD before. Uh, people of color, of course, had been complaining about this for decades. But now that white liberals understood what the problem was, they stopped supporting the incumbent mayor, Sam Yorty, and the search began for somebody who could challenge him. The city council had a vote about police conduct at Century City, and one member of the city council spoke out most critically of the LAPD's conduct. That was Tom Bradley. He was a black city councilman from the Crenshaw district and a former cop himself. And two years later, he ran for mayor. That's a story I'm gonna tell a, a, a little bit later. So the Century City protests also marked a turning point that began the process of transforming uh, the political culture of the, of the city of LA. 1968, what are you gonna do about LBJ? He's still president. He's still planning to run for uh, re-election. There's obviously two possibilities. One would be to challenge him in the primaries. Second would be to launch, to organize a third party. 
neither of these seem very promising. Uh, to challenge him in the primaries, you'd have to have a candidate. The one people thought might have a chance was Bobby Kennedy, but he refused to do it. Uh, not clear why, maybe it was because he thought it was hopeless, because indeed it was hopeless. Under the rules of the Democratic Party at the 1968 convention, you could win the presidential nomination without winning any primaries. And that's ex eventually what Hubert Humphrey eventually did. So the process of challenging LBJ in the primaries seemed quixotic. Uh, LA liberal donors did persuade a senator from Minnesota named Eugene McCarthy from taking on this quixotic task. Uh, this is now your Minnesota moment history from my hometown of St. Paul. Gene McCarthy started out his career in politics in St. Paul, representing the city in the House of Representatives when I was growing up. Uh, he became senator and then he ran for the Democratic nomination in the New Hampshire primary, February 1968. And he made history uh, by winning, almost winning the primary. And that forced LBJ to announce he was withdrawing from his own re-election campaign a week later. But the McCarthy campaign was never going to get very far. Uh, he was not a well-known figure. He was kind of a cerebral Catholic intellectual. He had no contacts, no presence in the communities of color of the United States. So a lot of people thought of the third party route. Of course, the third party route was also hopeless. You're never going to get on the ballot in enough states to get enough votes to unseat an incumbent president. But radicals in LA decided that the Democratic Party was a hopeless vehicle for opposing the war. And they set out to organize a new party. They called it the Peace and Freedom Party. Uh, it was very difficult in California to get a new party on the ballot. In fact, it hadn't happened since 1948 when the Progressive Party ran Henry Wallace for president. He'd been vice president for FDR. Uh, and then ran on a third party ticket opposing the Cold War in 1948, opposing Harry Truman, supporting civil rights and labor. He got only 4% of the vote. So this is going to be the first attempt to launch a new left wing party since 1948. Peace and Freedom began collecting the required signatures to get on the ballot at that Century City rally where Muhammad Ali spoke. Uh, this was the difficult thing about this was you had to persuade already registered voters to change their registration. This was the best way to do it. 1967, pretty much everybody was registered as a member of a party. So basically you had to convince Democrats to withdraw their registration from the Democratic Party and to register for this new party, Peace and Freedom. Here's some Peace and Freedom bumper stickers. Peace and Freedom Party was one of the most remarkable political organizations of LA in the 60s or California in the 60s. Just in LA County, there were 75 peace and freedom clubs, each of which had to have at least 25 members. And they were all working to get the party on the ballot. That, that meant there were at least 2000 people gathering signatures to get peace and freedom on the ballot, a huge undertaking. The rationale for the peace and freedom party was in its name. It was not just gonna be an anti-war party, it was also going to be a party that advocated for the rights of people of color. It was going to combine the two parts of the left. It was going to bring together black and white, unite and fight, fight for a new kind of politics in America. And when it came time to hand in the signatures, January 2nd, 1968, 66,000 signatures were required to get a new party on the ballot in California. Peace and Freedom handed in 105,000 signatures, and an amazing 37,000 of those came from LA County. So the idea was, this is gonna be an interracial party where blacks will share leadership with whites. But where could the white radicals who come up with the plan for the Peace and Freedom Party going to find black allies? Black movement politics in 1970 was organized around black power. A lot of it was what we called separatist. This was the era of Ron Karenga's US organization, very important in LA. Uh, it never welcomed white members. This was the era when SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, had 
kicked out its white members. There was only one group on the black left that was willing to work with white people, and that was the Black Panther Party. So Peace and Freedom organized an alliance with the Black Panther Party. It had, of course, it was based in Oakland, led by Huey P. Newton, Bobby Seale, and Eldridge Cleaver, but it had a chapter in Los Angeles. And the Panthers, as part of the agreement to join with Peace and Freedom, uh, insisted that they pick the presidential candidate. And they picked Eldridge Cleaver to be the presidential nominee of the Peace and Freedom Party. And the Peace and Freedom Party held a primary, but the organizers of the party supported the agreement with the Panthers. Eldridge should get the vote for primary. Eldridge Cleaver was started out as a famous author. He had been a convicted rapist who got out of prison, wrote a memoir that instantly made him a prominent black radical. The book Soul on Ice got fantastic reviews. Here are some of them from The Nation, The New York Times. Eldridge Cleaver, an intelligent and turbulent and passionate and eloquent man, said Robert Coles in The Atlantic. Now, there was one other person interested who wanted to be the presidential candidate of the Peace and Freedom Party, and that was Dick Gregory, comedian, longtime activist. Um, everybody knew Dick Gregory as a talented, uh, committed, really a terrific uh, person. Uh, but he didn't have a party. He didn't have an organization. He just had fans and followers. So when the convention came and the members of the new party voted, Eldridge Cleaver easily won the nomination. Uh, Dick Gregory did run as a third party write-in candidate uh, in several other states. Uh, now, here's Eldridge for president. You'll notice his poster says, gives equal billing to Black Panther Party and Peace and Freedom Party. There was one problem with this candidate. The Constitution says the president of the United States must be 35 years old. It's kind of arbitrary and ridiculous, but that's what the Constitution says. Eldridge Cleaver was not 35 years old. He was only 33. By the day that he would have been sworn in, if for some way he had been elected, he would have only been 34. So Eldridge Cleaver was not old enough to be president of the United States. And the California Secretary of State, who runs the ballot, quickly ruled that the name Eldridge Cleaver could not appear on the ballot. He wasn't qualified. Peace and Freedom appealed this ruling all the way to the state Supreme Court, lost there, and then appealed to the federal Supreme Court in Washington, lost there. They all said the Constitution is clear. So after all that work, the Peace and Freedom Party did not run a candidate for president on the ballot in 1968. The ballot line for president was blank for Peace and Freedom. Eldridge did campaign a little. He promised that if elected, he would abolish the police. That's something the president really doesn't have the power to do. The police are you know, part of the city or the county. He also promised that if elected, he said he would not move into the White House, but instead he would, quote, burn that motherfucker down. That was the kind of campaign that Eldridge ran, and he didn't run it for very long. He soon lost interest in campaigning when it was clear he wasn't going to be on the ballot. And in the end, he gave a speech at Stanford, kind of a famous speech, advocating what he called, and I apologize here for his language, advocating what he called, quote, pussy power, unquote. On election night, he announced he was throwing his support to the Yippie candidate, a pig named Pegasus, who had been nominated at the Yippie Festival of Life in Chicago on August 68. In making his announcement, Eldridge declared, quote, the pig is mightier than the cleaver, close quote. And that was the end of the Peace and Freedom Party in 1968. You'll see if you vote on Election Day 2024, there's still a peace and freedom line. They still run candidates for many offices. On Election Day in November 1968, Nixon carried California. 
he beat Hubert Humphrey 48% to 45%. And it was shocking that Nixon carried LA County 48 to 46. Four years earlier, LBJ had beaten Barry Goldwater in LA County by 400,000 votes. Now Nixon won by 43,000 votes in LA County. Peace and freedom, which had started out as such a huge, magnificent effort, ended in disaster. And what remains of the Eldridge Cleaver campaign today is the poster on a t-shirt, which you can buy online. 1969, a different kind of candidate ran for office in Los Angeles, Tom Bradley. He'd been a cop, not a Black Panther. He was a liberal Democrat. He'd been a Bobby Kennedy delegate to the 1968 Democratic National Convention. So remember where we are in 1969. This is following one of the worst years in American history, the assassination of Martin Luther King, the assassination of Bobby Kennedy in Los Angeles, the assassination uh, and, and the election of Richard Nixon. Some people would say things were actually worse in the United States in 1969 than they were with Trump as our president, some people would say. And in this world, Tom Bradley announced he was going to run for mayor. He would have been the first, he would become the first black mayor of Los Angeles. And what's striking about this campaign is that he ran it as a grassroots campaign, really a movement campaign, drawing on a lot of the same people who had been part of the Peace and Freedom Party. Um, thousands of activists going door to door at dozens of neighborhood uh, uh, organizations. Bradley campaigned the way everybody campaigns in American politics, meeting and greeting, shaking hands with people, kissing babies. But he had this huge grassroots organization, which doesn't exist in the photographs and barely exists in the documentary record, dozens of field offices throughout the white neighborhoods of Los Angeles, staffed by white liberals, many of whom had been at Century City two years before, and some white radicals who had learned at Century City that the old LA had to change. So the primary in LA, since it's the democratic city, the primary for the mayor especially was everything. But if nobody won a majority in the primary, there would be a runoff election. And here's the primary vote. Tom Bradley, 42%. The incumbent who supports the police, Sam Yorty, 26%. This was an incredible high point for progressive politics in Los Angeles. In some ways the high point in the entire history of the city until recent, uh, a couple of years ago, Tom Bradley did a stupendous job of defeating the incumbent mayor in the primary. And it looked after April 1st, 1969, like LA was about to get its first black mayor, which would have been a great thing to happen, you know, the year after the assassination of Martin Luther King and the year after Nixon was uh, elected president. But 42% is not 50%. So he had, had to face a runoff election. And Sam Yorty pulled out all the stops and ran a classic racist campaign. In the archives of the Bradley campaign, I found a typical Yorty stunt the week before election day, a parade of convertibles went down Ventura Boulevard in the San Fernando Valley. The Valley, of course, was the bedrock of the white conservative suburban vote uh, in LA in 1969. Uh, so this is a parade of black people in convertibles shouting Black is beautiful, raising the fist, uh, riding in cars with signs that said Bradley for mayor and black power. A black power car caravan through the whitest neighborhoods the weekend before election day. Bradley's campaign chief later said that someone had come to him, said they had been offered $5,000 to organize the black car caravan. And that if the Bradley campaign gave him a, a bigger offer, they would cancel their plans. Bradley said no. The result, Yorty won. Want to go that previous slide, this kind of, this is the politics of Sam Yorty, meeting with a Democratic mayor, meeting with the Republican president and the Republican attorney general uh, on behalf of so-called law and order. Uh, that's the kind of politics that Sam Yorty represented, the kind of the right wing of the Democratic Party. Um, wait, 
where are we here? So, Yorty wins. It's another four years before Bradley can run again. When Tom Bradley finally became mayor, 1973, it wasn't the result of a grassroots movement campaign. It was much more of a conventional mainstream Democratic Party campaign run by professional consultants, funded by downtown business interests, promising the redevelopment of downtown, which Bradley then presided over. So that's the end of the 60s as I'm telling the story. It's a story of a little bit of success and a lot of defeat. The one success is forcing LBJ to abandon his campaign, which is truly a historic thing. But the result, of course, was Nixon became president. The war in Vietnam continued for another four years. And LA, although it came close to represent, to electing a black mayor, that took another four years. And when Bradley finally became mayor, it was not as a movement leader, it was as a corporate establishment mayor. One last thing, then and now, people think of the 60s as a high point in pro of protest in American history. But the recent history of movement activism, in my opinion, is so much bigger and better. The Black Lives Matter protests in the summer of 2020 in particular. Nationwide, these involve 15 or 20 million people. This is according to the New York Times, our national newspaper of record. 15 or 20 million people demonstrating in hundreds of cities and towns, not for a day, but for weeks, for months. Protests led by young people of color protests that were gloriously multiracial and multicultural. And LA now has elected a black woman, Karen Bass is our mayor. She started out not as a cop like Tom Bradley did, but as a community organizer in South LA, head of the Community Coalition, an organization that's still going strong. Yes, yes, the police are still killing people in LA. Uh, there were, uh, last year, LAPD killed 14 people. In the Watts uprising, in one week, they killed 34. And yes, we have homeless camps now in LA that were unimaginable 60 years ago. Mainstream politics, of course, has changed dramatically. Nixon carried Los Angeles in 68. In 2020, Trump in Los Angeles County got 27%. Trump, of course, is trying again next year. 1968, we failed to defeat Nixon. In 2024, our first task is defeating Trump. Well, that's what I have to say. And now I'm interested in what you might have to say. Thank you so much, John. That was an incredible program. People are going nuts in the chat for it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just real quick, I highly recommend that you add Set the Night on Fire to your fall or winter reading list. And I, I know <laughs> Francis has been putting some um, links in the chat, so I think she'll do so again. And before we get to the question and answer period, I, I have to ask, if you enjoyed the program, please consider making a tax-deductible donation to the California Historical Society. Your contribution helps CHS continue its mission to collect share and honor the diverse stories that made and continue to make California what it is. And really every little bit helps, even $5. Again, you'll find a link to donate in the chat. So now we have some questions. People have been sharing their personal experiences, John. It's been amazing. Um, John White and Amelia Marshall, I think need their own books. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I'll try to condense some of these. Maybe we have time where I can read some of these long form, but I do have one question since we're archives nerds here. I want to know more about what sources you and Mike used while writing this book and if there was any surprises during the research process. Well, the uh, the proposal that Mike had in when we first started this um, was to, that it should be 60% oral history, that we should go out and interview all the old leaders and activists, and uh, it should be a book about them. But we quickly found out we were a little too late. Some of the key people had died. Some of the people who were left were not in good enough health to talk to us. Some couldn't remember things as well as we could. Uh, so that was one of the biggest surprises. If you want to do oral histories, 
do it while your parents, your grandparents, your movement leaders, before they get old, do it while they're, they're still capable of telling the whole story. Um, so instead we relied overwhelmingly on print sources. Mike is, was a print maniac. You know, he read every, every page, not only of the LA Times, even though it was a, had a right-wing Republican business uh, editorial policy, it's a huge newspaper reporting on local everything, uh, local college demonstrations, um, local protests. So we got a huge amount just from the LA Times, which fortunately had just been digitized. Um, oh, there were also lots of movement sources. There was the LA Free Press, the underground press. There was underground papers all over the place. Um, there, uh, and we discovered that all of the state colleges in the area have their own collections and they've collected different special things. Cal State Long Beach, women's history. Uh, Cal State Northridge the, has hundreds of boxes of Bradley campaign materials. Um, Cal State LA has a big movement, just a collection of movement materials, all kinds of stuff. So we were surprised by how rich the, the how much work the archivists had been doing in the 60s in, in collecting stuff. And I know um, if you look at the California Historical Society uh, catalog, it says there are eight file boxes of movement ephemera. This has got to be a gold mine for somebody. Open those boxes. See what ephemera is like leaflets, newsletters, stuff that was passed out on the streets, posters. Somebody look in those eight boxes and see what the ephemera about the movement in the Bay Area uh, is at the California Historical Society. As a, as a former archivist in the early times of my career, I can say the ephemera, the things people were supposed to throw away are often some of the most fascinating relics from our history. So, okay, we have we have a lot of people sharing actually that they've never heard about the Century uh, Plaza protest and that's kind of shocking to them. Um, and I'm wondering if you think that has something to do with the coverage in the mainstream press because they sort of overlooked this, although, of course, you know, press is very rarely biased. Um, <laughs> thanks for, re thanks for that reminder. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think the coverage of the of the LA Times versus the coverage of the LA Free Press is one of the reasons why we haven't heard this history? Well, it was very big news in LA. Uh, I showed you there was those huge scare headlines in the LA Times. Where it wasn't news was anywhere else. I think partly in 1968, not only was there no internet, there uh, there was barely you know live news that covered more you know than the news was somebody sitting in a studio, uh, you know, uh, some Dan Rather type, Walter Cronkite reading to you reports written by somebody. So. Uh, that's the way we found out about Vietnam. There wasn't any live reporting from Vietnam. Uh, so partly there, the news reporting was just a very parochial thing and Los Angeles was not considered. And uh, you know, it was the place for entertainment. It wasn't the place for, for politics. So I think that's part of it. Um, it is a good thing that the underground press in, in California and especially in Los Angeles was very politically oriented and not just you know Dr. Hippocrates and uh, instructions on uh, new ways to get high, uh, which is a fine topic, but it's not the only thing we want to know about the 60s. So I think it's more about the parochialism and kind of the mainstream bias. But I mean, uh, the president f being afraid he's going to have to leave his own uh, uh, fundraiser because of protests, that's, that should be national news, and it wasn't. And we have a great comment by Anthony that dovetails with a question that I had queued up for you earlier. So Anthony said that he was delighted at the concentration on young people's activism and set the night on fire. You both did not embed these stories writing um, uh, within youth historiography, but that's a task remaining for the rest of us. But he points out that Mike him, has always advocated for histories about youth agency. And that's one of the things that resonated most with me in your book is hearing how high school age kids really were able to impact movements in LA and how unique that was to LA. Can you expand on that? Yeah, this is, these were uh, in some ways, Mike's uh, most original 
writing and contribution was the work he did in, un, in, in uncovering, digging up the history of the high school protests of 1969 in Los Angeles at Black and, and Chicano high schools, uh, student uh, rebellions demanding better education. Uh, these are not kids demanding, you know, uh, more to, more days off. Uh, they want high quality education about their own history. Um, and, uh, you know, the teachers call the police. Uh, the biggest difference between then and now is we had a teacher strike, what is it now, four years, three, three years ago, I think. And the difference between the, sc the schools in 1969 and the schools in the present time is today the teachers and the families and the students are united in demanding better schools. Uh, the teacher picket lines, the teachers union of Los Angeles spent a year before their strike meeting with parents and community groups. What do you want out of your schools? So that when the strike finally came, it was a joint community parents uh, event to try to get smaller classrooms and, and uh, better education. So that's one thing that really has changed. And uh, it all started with young people of color um, at LA's big, terrible public high schools in, uh, in the late 60s. So moving from youth culture to union culture in LA, we have a question from Marty. Could you discuss the role of United Farm Workers, ILGWU, and other progressive unions in building a progressive left politics in LA in the 60s and early 70s? You know, today, um, the LA County Federation of Labor is a huge force, can mobilize tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people uh, for progressive uh, political candidates, for fundraising, and for picket line, thousands of people on picket lines. Just in the last month, we have seen this in Los Angeles. Um, this is this was a, a revolution in, or in the AFL-CIO in Los Angeles, uh, ca carried out um, in the 80s, uh, really a, a, the, a Latino uh, revolution inside uh, the unions, led especially by the janitor's union, and that hotel and restaurant workers unite here, local 10. Um, in the, the official organized labor in LA of the 60s mostly supported Yorty and the police. Uh, you're quite right that the that the uh, there were radical unions. Uh, the um, longshoremen were still an incredibly radical union, but they didn't play a very active part in uh, this kind of movement politics uh, in the 60s. And the farm workers. You know, their main, the main presence of the farm workers in LA, first of all, was as an inspiring force, but uh, organizing the grape boycott. So this was not so much, um, you know, militant street protests against the war or uh, against uh, the, the president. It was to support the farm workers uh, with the grape boycott. And of course, lots of us spent lot, lots of time on that. So the, um, the transformation of the LA labor movement is a product of Latino uh, activity, uh, starting with really the Justice for Janitors strike uh, of the 80s. And that story was all told in the LA Weekly, uh, a magnificent source on, on, on that history. And it remains, I mean, the hotel workers are on strike right now, Unite Here, uh, uh, Local 10, great organization. Marty, if you're interested in more labor history, the labor archives here in San Francisco connected to San Francisco State University is an incredible resource and they do incredible programs. You know, I don't know a whole lot about uh, the the um, labor movement in, in LA in the 60s. Of course, there's the UAW also was a force. Uh, they, they were mainly trying to prevent the destruction of the uh auto industry which happened in the starting in the 70s so i think we could use a good labor history of of la in the 60s so please help us <laughs> yes everybody help us do the history i think that should be the standard bearer for every historian talk <laughs> We have an early question um, from Amelia Marshall, who has so much to say, I just like want to meet her offline, but um, <laughs> she's asking about the role of the Communist Party and a lot of this activism. Um, Mike Davis was identified as a member, she says, so yes. was she. Um, 
and the question directly for you is, do you think the Communist Party in the U.S. got a bad rap from the new left in the context of L.A. in the 1960s? The L.A. Communist Party is a, in the 60s is an important force in the life of Mike Davis and in the movements here. They were uh, the L.A. Party was headed by a renegade leader named Dorothy Healy. And we, everybody on the left loved Dorothy. Um, she was constantly fighting with Gus Hall and the national leadership. And she was very much committed to, uh, to a black movement, people of color, uh, young people. Uh, she recruited Mike, she recruited Angela Davis. Uh, and she helped, you know, the black, uh, they set up the Chela Mumba Caucus, as which was sort of uh, not favored by the National Party, but for Dorothy, you know, people of color need their own branch of the or their own faction organized in 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 L.A. And this is part of Mike's. Mike says the most important source of his political education was arguing with Dorothy Healy. And he still laments the fact that we lost what he called an organization of organizers. Uh, of course. The Communist Party put almost all of its efforts starting in 1969 into the Angela Davis Defense Committee. The, you know, the most famous trial of the of the late 60s, the most famous black leader, the most the most uh, outrageous uh, repression and jailing of, of a black leader uh, and the not guilty verdict in the Angela Davis uh, trial was one of the high points of movement history in LA. We tell that story in our book. Um, and they were part of a lot of, uh, I mean, Mike as a member of the Communist Party was, you know, traveling around to all the state colleges and, uh, but I would say most of their work went in, starting in 69, went into the Angela Davis Defense Committee because this was one of their leaders who was being railroaded. And we have more questions coming, so I hope you're ready to stay for the long haul here, John. <laughs> I'll try. Um, <laughs> so could you please describe the two cultures on either side, west and east of Central Avenue? So that's a really great question. This is Jim Crow in LA, and the segregation was yeah, very yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Mike likes to say that, you know, going back to the 40s, there was uh, Alameda was the dividing line. Uh, between the CIO territory and the Ku Klux Klan territory. Um, and uh, that persisted in different forms for a long time. I mean, people don't realize how that there was real active racist organizing in LA in the, <clears throat> in the going back to the 30s and 40s there, you know, there was a Nazi party brown shirts in Los Angeles. Um, but there were black radicals and there were white radicals, and there were a few who were interested in bringing them together, the Communist Party, some of the CIO, uh, but our, your, the, I see we have a message here from Anthony. Anthony, my old student. Hello, Anthony. Nice to, nice to have you here. He knows a lot of this history too. I mean, it's possible some people in the audience may know more about <clears throat> this history than I do. So please chime in. I don't have all the answers here. I'm happy to have other people explain answers, give answers too. <laughs> Anthony says, still your student. <laughs> <laughs> we have a few more questions. Let's see. Um, Kenny says, can you speak to LA being the birthplace of Asian American political identity? Great question. We do have, <clears throat> you know, this was an, this was, Another one of those things where we look to San Francisco State. San Francisco State had the first Asian American studies program, demands, demonstrations. Uh, in LA, uh, we learned from San Francisco State, uh, but UCLA did, we have a chapter in our book about Gidra, the first Asian American radical newspaper of LA in the 60s, which really is part of the, part of the 70s. And it's interesting, who were Asian Americans in LA in 19, in the late 60s and the early 70s? Uh, Gidra uh, was basically Japanese Americans. They were the ones who were going to college. Um, you know, there were very few 
Chinese people in California had families with college age children in the 60s because of the immigration policy. And they certainly weren't wealthy enough uh, to be live in neighborhoods that they had the good high schools that sent their kids to, uh, to UCLA. Uh, and the whole uh, Korean LA, Koreatown, that's a product much later uh, of the 70s and 80s. And uh, the other parts of Asian America are also uh, much later. So we do have a student radical presence, uh, very important to them that the war in Vietnam is a war against Asians. It's a big organizing point. And the first anti-war demonstrations in little Tokyo are historic events, which we discuss in our book. Um, it's a fascinating history. It's an important history and it's, in many ways, following the lead of San Francisco State. Well, as a, an alum of SF State and the history department, that warms my heart. <laughs> <laughs> we have a comment in the chat about um, how valuable the way your book sort of tells many different stories of all of these interwoven um, movements in LA history. And we talked a little bit before about how popular culture likes to view the 60s as this unified radical moment in American history, but of course it wasn't. Can you talk about a little bit like the women's liberation uh, movement, for example, how there were different communities asking for different needs to be met? Yeah, that's a, I'm very glad you brought that up. We're, I'm, we're proud of that, <laughs> of that part. Um, and, and the women's liberation movement is a great example. Uh, they're often considered to be a white movement and indeed, women's liberation self-identified as such was a largely white movement but in los angeles there was a welfare rights movement based in the black housing pro public housing projects um and headed by black women who were terrific organizers and uh who made their own history um and a couple of years later there was also a very important uh chicano movement uh, around uh, not abortion rights, but around sterilization. There was a kind of eugenicist practice, it turned out, at the LA County Hospital of sterilizing young uh, Mexican women uh, who they could get their hands on, basically, who were in the hospital uh, for something else. And there was a big lawsuit. It's the origin of a lot of uh, of Mexican American and uh, Latino and Latina politics in LA comes out of the lawsuits against the county hospitals for the to stop the sterilization programs. So these are we call it three faces of <clears throat> of the women's movement in Los Angeles. Very different. Really didn't have anything to do with each other, but each in its own way, very well organized, very focused, and with these significant achievements. We have another question about the youth culture that you highlight in the book. What parts of 50s and 60s youth culture do you think are overlooked? And what details do you want to see talked about more? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. That's a tough one. Do I want to see talked about more? I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I'd be happy to hear what, what the questioner uh, thinks is uh, should be talked about more. You're still with us. Um, put it in the Q and A, and I'll feed it. <laughs> I'll feed it to John. I'm going to selfishly ask you one of the questions. I I want to know the answer. Sure. To. Um, the title of the book references a lyric by one of my favorite bands growing up, uh, The Doors. So why that band and why that lyric? You know, the interesting thing, the history that I recited of the origins of, of this book, Mike always wanted to call this <clears throat> "Setting the Night on Fire." That was the idea that he had you know, almost 20 years ago, he wanted to write a book about LA in the 60s called Setting the Night on Fire. The song is actually Set the Night on Fire. Uh, so the lyric, the lyric from the Doors song. Um, so we corrected that in our title. Uh, John Densmore, the drummer for the Doors is still very active presence uh, in Venice. See, We see him a lot at playing the drums at protests and at movement events and 
just did a was at Beyond Baroque a couple of months ago for a, for a movement event. And we, we interviewed John Densmore. We talked to Den, John Densmore, uh, first of all, to ask him permission if we could use their lyric. And, you know, he's, a move, he's been a movement guy ever since. The door, what we liked about The Doors was not just, of course, the song is kind of an anthem. Here, we, we quote the line. I brought my book. The time to hesitate is through. No time to wallow in the mire. Try to set the night on fire. That's the part that we liked of, of this song. Maybe you remember it too. Um, the Doors, famous story about The Doors, The Doors fans know. In 1968, Buick offered The Doors $75,000 to use the song in a commercial. And when Jim Morrison found out, he called the company and said he would personally smash a Buick on TV with a sledgehammer if they used the song. Uh, and so they didn't. Um, Jim Morrison died in 1971. And since then, John Densmore has taken up the flag to make sure that the Doors music is never used to advertise capitalist uh, products. In the interview with John Densmore, he told us one line that we quote on the first page of our book. The seeds of civil rights and the peace movement and feminism were planted in the 60s. They are big seeds. Maybe they take 50 or 100 years to reach fruition. So stop complaining and go get out your watering can. That's my rap. So we decided to use the song line as our title. I think that might be a great place to end our Q&A. I know we didn't get quite to get to everybody, but I think we captured most of what you all were trying to learn more about. Um, John, is there anything else you would like to add before we sort of close out our evening? I just want to thank you, Nicole. You've you've had a tough job. This is a rough crew out there, I know. <laughs> you've, you've held your own. So thank you very much. I really appreciated having you as our leader tonight. <laughs> thank you so much, John. This was an event of a lifetime for me. And that concludes our program for the night. We hope to see you back here next month as well. Please join us for our next program, Portal, San Francisco's Ferry Building and the Reinvention of American Cities with architectural critic John King. He's a legend in the Bay Area. That's Tuesday, October 24th, live via Zoom. Look for the registration link on the CHS website under upcoming events. And thank you again to John, Aaron Garcia, and Francis Kaplan in the chat for a wonderful evening. And many thanks to everyone in our audience who was so polite and kind and gave such great comments and shared their memories with us. That's it for us. Have a great night, history friends.